in this particular panel, we'll, we'll be discussing critical race training and its impact on higher education. And our contention is that it's problematic and it's causing a lot of harm to a lot of people. And the reason that we titled this program training and not theory, critical race training in higher education is that critical race theory is a doctrine. And I'll talk a little bit about that. The others might have other things to say, uh, but it's not really my concern, frankly, if somebody wants to read about that or teach about that or pontificate about it. Um, the uh, detriment to higher ed, in my view, is when that theory moves into practice and becomes mandatory training and mandatory um, requirements on campuses. So what is critical race theory? And again, others may have other views. Um, I think in some ways it's easiest to explain what it's not. It is not what people of my generation, uh, you know, people who are in their early 60s, uh, who maybe grew up in the 60s and the 70s, think of as the civil rights movement. Um, it is not the concept of judging people by the content of their character, not the color of their skin. In fact, it's just the opposite. It is everything about judging people by the color of their skin. And it is not uh, about equality or equal opportunity. It is about equity. Uh, equity is a word you will see used very frequently and it may slip by you. You may think equity means equality and that's not actually what it means. It means an equality of outcome as opposed to an equality of opportunity, as opposed to an equality of treatment. Um, and so it's not about affording all citizens equal rights, regardless of race or ethnicity. Um, it's not about what was the ethos at, when I was growing up of the civil rights movement, which is affording everyone of every race a full seat at the American table. It is in fact about flipping that table over. A model of social life and political structures uh, and economic sy uh, systems is founded upon race. And here's a word you're gonna hear a lot. Because of that is the foundation of our society and that is the nature of our society in their view, uh, racism is systemic uh, and therefore they advocate that that system has to be overturned uh, in varying degrees. The modern uh, incarnation of critical race theory, at least on campuses, is I think epitomized by the book, How to Be an Anti-Racist. It creates two competing parties. Um, you are either racist or you are anti-racist. There is no middle ground. There, you cannot be simply not racist. Simply treating everybody fairly is a racist act actually, um, according to that doctrine. You have to be an activist. You have to actively participate in seeking to root out racism and to explore your own racism. It's very much a doctrine where you're either with us or you are against us. There is no middle ground. And if you are against us, by definition, you are racist. Um, and that has profound implications for free speech on campus, campus and for the free exchange of ideas. Because um, if you disagree with them, then you are racist. And if you are racist, according to a lot of people on campuses, you have no right to be on campus, you have no right to speak. Um, so this is a very pernicious doctrine that I think is gonna have a pr profound impact. And it now permeates on many campuses every aspect of campus life. Cornell is turning itself at the direction of the president's office into an anti-racist campus. And the end result, and what I see as the real harm that's gonna happen here, is that it goes in, it's an interference in academic freedom. It is an interference in people's ability to speak freely. So we're, we're really heading into what I see as a very, very bad, area is a juggernaut that has um, accelerated since the death of George Floyd. And I think that a lot of the events have been exploited to push this forward. So my perspective is different because I am staff. So 
I decided to return to Northampton because in my mind, I, you know, I'd remembered it as a super liberal place. And I always thought of myself as a super liberal. About a year after I started working at Smith College, something happened on campus. Um, a black student accused a white staff member, a custodian, of engaging in racially motivated behavior against her. And she did not file a formal complaint. She actually, this was in a Facebook post and the college immediately uh, went into full on apology mode um, and started um, creating initiatives and um, councils and committees to address this problem of racism on campus and um, immediately went into supporting this narrative that we had a, a very bad problem of racism on campus, and this is where I started hearing the term systemic racism, structural racism. And this was before an investigation had even begun or been conducted in any way. Um, so they did do an independent investigation. It was very thorough. And I think any reasonable person would be very hard pressed to read the outcome, the ex look at the exhibits and the outcome of that investigation, which are public on Smith's website and know the context and the facts surrounding this incident and, and argue that it was a racially motivated incident. I think it would be hard to do that. Nevertheless, um, the college still persisted in this narrative that this there was a huge problem of racism at Smith College, kind of the backdrop against which I am entering higher education into this very highly racialized environment in which everything's about race and the college's um, proposed solution to this racism problem is to have a lot of trainings and a lot of discussions. And most of these discussions um, for the mostly white staff are about um, whiteness and white privilege and so on and so forth, where I did have to attend trainings where um, we, we discussed our identities, um, gender, race, other protected characteristics. <clears throat> And these discussions always felt uh, very scripted and uh, performative in nature. Last December, uh, I was told that I was going to be mandated to attend a three-day professional development retreat and that the first day would be devoted to discussing our identities. It felt very uncomfortable to me. And so I talked to my supervisor and I said, you know, I'm not comfortable discussing my race at work. Like I just had decided I didn't want to do that anymore. And she said that, you know, that's not an issue. Just say that at the workshop. So in January, I attended this workshop with my colleagues in residence life and the hired facilitators went around the room and asked everybody to talk about their, how they understand their race and or culture in the context of their childhood and their adolescence. And then it got to me and I abstained. I just said, I'm uncomfortable talking about that at work. But a little bit later, the hired facilitators said to the group that any white person who exhibits discomfort or any kind of resistance toward discussing their race when asked to is actually not uncomfortable at all. Um, what they're doing is they're displaying symptoms of white fragility and it is a power play. I realized that I was in a position now where shame, public shaming, which is which is what that was, under by hired facilitators under the auspices of Smith College, um, authorized by my supervisors, public shaming was now being used, and that's when I realized that. Um, I couldn't just, quote, keep my head down and my mouth shut anymore. Um, like, as Bill said, you're either anti-racist or you're racist. And um, simply abstaining or remaining silent is considered racist. It, in, in this case, it was framed as an act of aggression. My response was to go and file a complaint with the Institutional Equity Compliance Officer at Smith. At the same time, the college released a document, a four-page document um, called Toward Racial Justice at Smith. More trainings, more discussions, a proposed class, proposed uh, mandatory class for students, one thing, which is unusual at Smith because Smith does not have mandatory classes for students outside their major, along with mandatory trainings for staff. There are proposals to start evaluating pay based on um equity um, across registers of social identity, as they put it, book, How to Be an Anti-Racist. Um, I was given documents called um, White Supremacy and Me, and um, I was signed up for the um, White Staff Accountability Group. 
So I sent one last email out to several members of the president's cabinet and some deans um, just saying, you know, I have a complaint pending. I feel like now everything's been ramped up more. Now there's more stuff coming here at me. And this is really a racially hostile work environment. And nobody responded to that email. So six days later, I decided to make a video and I posted it to YouTube. Staff are very, very afraid that anything they, they say to a student will be could be construed as some kind of racism. They've already been told in essence that they are racist simply by being white. Um, so you can only imagine the environment that, that we are working in at Smith College. Critical theories, especially in that racial space, tend to paint one group of people as heroes and another as villains. Uh, teaching a focus on racial differences very often intensifies rather than reduces tensions. But to me, as a methods focused person, this is what I'm going to focus on today. The biggest problem with CRT or critical training in an educational, empirical environment is that so many of the core principles are just wrong. The basic idea of all critical theories, most of which originally came out of the Marxist influenced quote unquote Frankfurt School and its contemporaries, is that systems that seem facially neutral are in fact set up primarily to oppress somebody. And this is really a very influential idea on the political left. What critical race theory specifically does is replace the working class with blacks or with racial minorities as this sort of imagined group that the entire system was designed to beat down. Is a mathematical claim that all disparities in performance are proof of oppression. And that's kind of right in my wheelhouse as a researcher. So crits, critical theorists say this quite openly already been proven by the existence of these disparities. And there are a lot of other ideas associated with this whole paradigm that are presented in kind of empirical, quasi-scientific terms. So white fragility is the idea that whites never hear criticism about their race as versus POC, so they are measurably more sensitive to criticism. Uh, white privilege is the idea that just being Caucasian confers a measurable benefit and for example income terms only onto whites but the problem with these arguments to me as a wonk is that virtually all of them collapse if you just start honestly analyzing the underlying claims using any basic modern technique uh, linear regression logistic regression well done cross tabulations a lot of this turns out to be bluntly nonsense i find when i do serious research that almost all of the gaps between groups that are used to quote unquote prove racism in the trainings conducted by, for example, a Dr. Kendi or a Robin D'Angelo simply vanish if you adjust for any traits other than race that also differ between groups. None of this means that racism, the near race wars of the past in the USA, had no impact on black or minority or working class Americans. Uh, past oppression, if we're, and also if we're being honest, the culture that grew out of it is almost certainly the reason why there's more crime or less studying on average in quote unquote the hood. But what all of this does prove is that there's no hidden invisible racial force inside our systems that stops black people or anyone else from succeeding and teaching that there is is generally a variety of academic malfeasance. Today, a black guy, a white guy, and an Asian guy from Cleveland, Ohio, who are all the same age and years and have the same board scores, are gonna go on to have very much the same life. Something like 18 minority groups earned more than the average for quote unquote, all whites. So that's my issue with critical race theory and this entire process of trainings, Kendi's, D'Angelo's, uh, Black Lives Matters that have come out of it. It's not that it's too edgy and challenging or that it makes white people justly afraid or something like that. It's that in a world where Asian and African guys make up 20 plus percent of the Ivy League and are suing to expand that, it's pretty much just wrong. It seems like a series of dated ideas that basic analysis often debunks. There, there's a bureaucratic therapeutic apparatus of administration within the universities that we should see this through the lens of. That there's a kind of, uh, there's an entrepreneurial project by a set of um, people that have a certain set of ideas that they wanna bring into the world and they're in the process of institutionalizing them. And, and so 
and, and so they're creating their own demand. And in the absence of any need for their professional services, they're going to create sort of ever more expansive definitions of the terms of harm and trauma, because you have these people on payroll who, whose job it is to respond to these things and who therefore like need to have instances of things for themselves to respond to. And so they will take any opportunity and they will sort of promulgate definitions of harm and trauma is such that they can justify their continued existence in their roles. It really is at some fundamental level as simple as that. And in this case, we're not talking about a war, we're talking about people who are trying to embed themselves within institutions. Many things that like sort of student activists have been demanding for the last few years of student activism, schools were holding them at bay. But like after sort of a group of people went into the streets and demonstrated their willingness to, uh, you know, to tear apart the country, right? Like there was a sense <laughs> that, 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 that all of these kind of like, uh, all of these sort of like bureaucratic changes that, 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 you, that, that, that the power to resist them, like, you know, sort of like went down the drain at that very moment. You have a sort of activist class. The activist class has a particular set of interests. Those interests are sort of premised on the existence of uh, like a great moral problem that they exist in order to address. If that problem were to be resolved to, the, to their satisfaction, there would be no more need uh, for these people in order to continue to sort of enrich themselves, uh, sort of, you know, have access to sinecures. And, and the, the, the sort of most effective way for them to go about doing this is to sort of promulgate a set of axioms that, that they believe, <laughs> and, and, and that become axiomatic in the worldview, that become sort of doctrines that one, uh, that one is not able to dissent from, and everything else follows from it thing that is driving all of this, right? Like there is this kind of bureaucratic mission creep. There is this kind of moral entrepreneurialism that we see at work. And the other thing that I want to talk about sort of with regard to what Jody was saying is that the, the sort of apparatus of kind of like mind cure, <laughs> the apparatus of, uh, you know, the, the apparatus of, uh, of surveillance and repression and the uh, uh, sort of model repressive apparatus that we're seeing at work um, it, with, with regard to race was first created with regard to sort of sexual assault and sexual harassment, um, you know, through, through the Title IX system. And it's that sort of model apparatus that we now see, especially after the George Floyd protests, being sort of like exported from the, you know, the realm of the Title IX regime into a more encompassing one like it ultimately is not, as sort of Jacobson mentioned, just a matter of the fact that like people are thinking these ideas, writing about them. And it's not just that they are erroneous as Riley pointed out. It is that they have behind them the force of administrative decree. <laughs>